Lesson 1 The Creation Sabbath Afternoon March 26 In God's Word only we find an authentic account of creation. In this Word only can we find a history of our race unsullied by human prejudice or human pride. Here we may hold communion with patriarchs and prophets and listen to the voice of the Eternal as He speaks with men. Here we behold the majesty of heaven as He humbled Himself to become our substitute and surety to cope single-handed with the powers of darkness and to gain the victory in our behalf. A reverent contemplation of such themes as these cannot fail to soften, purify, and ennoble the heart and at the same time to inspire the mind with new strength and vigor. My Life Today, page 107 God speaks to the human family in language they can comprehend. He does not leave the matter so indefinite that human beings can handle it according to their theories. When the Lord declares that He made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, He means the day of twenty-four hours which He has marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. After He had created our world and man, He looked upon the work that He had done and pronounced it very good. And when the foundation of the earth was laid, the foundation of the Sabbath was laid also. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God saw that a Sabbath was essential for man, even in paradise. In giving the Sabbath, God considered man's spiritual and physical health. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 136. In the beginning, God was revealed in all the works of creation. It was Christ that spread the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. It was His hand that hung the worlds in space and fashioned the flowers of the field. His strength setteth fast the mountains. The sea is His, and He made it. Psalm 65, verse 6, and Psalm 95, verse 5. It was He that filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. And upon all things in earth and air and sky, he wrote the message of the Father's love. Now sin has marred God's perfect work, yet that handwriting remains. Even now all created things declare the glory of His excellence. The Desire of Ages, page 20 Through the creation we are to become acquainted with the Creator. The Book of Nature is a great lesson book, which in connection with the scriptures we are to use in teaching others of his character and guiding lost sheep back to the fold of God. In these lessons direct from nature, there is a simplicity and purity that makes them of the highest value. All need the teaching to be derived from this source. In itself, the beauty of nature leads the soul away from sin and worldly attractions and toward purity, peace, and God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 24. Sunday, March 27. The God of Creation. In the creation of man was manifest the agency of a personal God. When God had made man in his image, the human form was perfect in all its arrangements but it was without life. Then a personal, self-existing God breathed into that form the breath of life, and man became a living, intelligent being. All parts of the human organism were set in action. The heart, the arteries, the veins, the tongue, the hands, the feet, the senses, the faculties of the mind, all began their work and all were placed under law. Man became a living soul. Through Christ, the Word, a personal God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. Above all lower orders of being, God designed that man, the crowning work of his creation, should express his thought and reveal his glory. But man is not to exalt himself as God. The Ministry of Healing, page 415 Through the psalmist, the message was given to Israel. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
come before his presence with singing, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Psalm 100, verses 2-4 to And of all who keep the Sabbath from polluting it, the Lord declares, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 and 7. The Desire of Ages, page 288. In the name of Jesus, we may come into God's presence with the confidence of a child. No man is needed to act as a mediator. Through Jesus, we may open our hearts to God as to one who knows and loves us. In the secret place of prayer, where no eye but God's can see, no ear but His can hear, we may pour out our most hidden desires and longings to the Father of infinite pity, and in the hush and silence of the soul, that voice which never fails to answer the cry of human need will speak to our hearts. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. James chapter 5 verse 11. He waits with unwearied love to hear the confessions of the wayward and to accept their penitence. He watches for some return of gratitude from us as the mother watches for the smile of recognition from her beloved child. He would have us understand how earnestly and tenderly his heart yearns over us. He invites us to take our trials to his sympathy, our sorrows to his love, our wounds to his healing, our weakness to his strength, our emptiness to his fullness. Never has one been disappointed who came unto him. They looked unto him and were enlightened, and their faces were not ashamed. Psalm 34, verse 5. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 84 and 85. Monday, March 28. The Creation. The earth came forth from the hand of the Creator exceedingly beautiful. There were mountains and hills and plains, and interspersed among them were rivers and bodies of water. The earth was not one extensive plain, but the monotony of the scenery was broken by hills and mountains, not high and ragged as they now are, but regular and beautiful in shape. The bare, high rocks were never seen upon them, but lay beneath the surface, answering as bones to the earth. The waters were regularly dispersed. The hills, mountains, and very beautiful plains were adorned with plants and flowers and tall majestic trees of every description, which were many times larger and much more beautiful than trees now are. The air was pure and healthful, and the earth seemed like a noble palace. Angels beheld and rejoiced at the wonderful and beautiful works of God. Lift Him Up, page 47. God's created works testify to His love and power. He has called the world into being with all that it contains. God is a lover of the beautiful, and in the world which He has fitted up for us, He has not only given us everything necessary for our comfort, but He has filled the heavens and the earth with beauty. We see His love and care in the rich fields of autumn and His smile in the glad sunshine. His hand has made the castle-like rocks and the towering mountains. The lofty trees grow at His command. He has spread earth's green velvet carpet and dotted it with shrubs and flowers. Why has He clothed the earth and trees with living green instead of with dark, somber brown? Is it not that they may be more pleasing to the eye? And shall not our hearts be filled with gratitude as we read the evidences of His wisdom and love in the wonders of His creation? Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 185 No finite mind can fully comprehend the existence, the power, the wisdom, or the works of the Infinite One. Says the sacred writer, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. 
what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Job chapter 11 verses 7 to 9. The mightiest intellects of earth cannot comprehend God. Men may be ever searching, ever learning, and still there is an infinity beyond. Yet the works of creation testify of God's power and greatness. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Psalm 19, verse 1. Those who take the written word as their counselor will find in science an aid to understand God. The invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 116. Tuesday, March 29. The Sabbath By thus setting apart the Sabbath, God gave the world a memorial. He did not set apart one day and any day in seven, but one particular day, the seventh day. And by observing the Sabbath, we show that we recognize God as the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. There is nothing in the Sabbath that restricts it to any particular class of people. It was given for all mankind. It is to be employed, not in indolence, but in the contemplation of the works of God. This men are to do, that they may know that I am the Lord, that sanctify them. The Lord draws very nigh to his people on the day that he has blessed and sanctified. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The Sabbath is God's memorial, pointing men to their Creator, who made the world and all things that are therein. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 136 and 137. The importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of creation is that it keeps ever-present the true reason why worship is due to God, because He is the Creator and we are His creatures. The Sabbath, therefore, lies at the very foundation of divine worship, for it teaches this great truth in the most impressive manner, and no other institution does this. The true ground of divine worship, not of that on the seventh day merely, but of all worship, is found in the distinction between the Creator and His creatures. This great fact can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. Jan Andrews, History of the Sabbath Chapter 27. So long as the fact that He is our Creator continues to be a reason why we should worship Him, so long the Sabbath will continue as its sign and memorial. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. The Great Controversy, pages 437 and 438. Wherefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. These words are full of instruction and comfort. Because the Sabbath was made for man, it is the Lord's day. It belongs to Christ. For all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3. Since he made all things, he made the Sabbath, by him it was set apart as a memorial of the work of creation. It points to him as both the creator and the sanctifier. The Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy, and it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who through Christ become a part of the Israel of God. The Desire of Ages, page 288. Wednesday, March 30 The Creation of Humanity The Lord created man out of the dust of the earth. He made Adam a partaker of his life, his nature. There was breathed into him the breath of the Almighty, and he became a living soul. Adam was perfect in form, strong, comely, pure, 
bearing the image of his maker. Man came from the hand of his creator, perfect in organization and beautiful in form. The fact that he has for 6,000 years withstood the ever-increasing weight of disease and crime is conclusive proof of the power of endurance with which he was first endowed. Adam was crowned king in Eden. To him was given dominion over every living thing that God had created. The Lord blessed Adam and Eve with intelligence such as he had not given to any other creature. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1082. Man was the crowning act of the creation of God, made in the image of God and designed to be a counterpart of God. Man is very dear to God because he was formed in his own image. As Adam came forth from the hand of his Creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than twice as tall as men now living upon the earth and was well proportioned. His features were perfect and beautiful. His complexion was neither white nor sallow, but ruddy, glowing with the rich tint of health. Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. She too was noble, perfect in symmetry, and very beautiful. Created to be the image and glory of God, Adam and Eve had received endowments not unworthy of their high destiny. Graceful and symmetrical in form, regular and beautiful in feature, their countenances glowing with the tint of health and the light of joy and hope, they bore in outward resemblance the likeness of their Maker. My Life Today, page 126 the Lord was pleased with this last and noblest of all his creatures and designed that he should be the perfect inhabitant of a perfect world. But it was not his purpose that man should live in solitude. He said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided an help meet for him, a helper corresponding to him one who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him. A part of man, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, she was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. The Adventist Home, page 25. Thursday, March 31. The Duty of Humanity The Lord's purposes are not the purposes of men. He did not design that men should live in idleness. In the beginning, he created man a gentleman. But though rich in all that the owner of the universe could supply, Adam was not to be idle. No sooner was he created than his work was given him. He was to find employment and happiness in tending the things that God had created, and in response to his labor, his wants were to be abundantly supplied from the fruits of the Garden of Eden. While our first parents obeyed God, their labor in the garden was a pleasure, and the earth yielded of its abundance for their wants. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, pages 273 and 274. God gave Adam and Eve employment. Eden was the school for our first parents, and God was their instructor. They learned how to till the soil and to care for the things which the Lord had planted. They did not regard labor as degrading, but as a great blessing. Industry was a pleasure to Adam and Eve. The fall of Adam changed the order of things. The earth was cursed, but the decree that man should earn his bread by the sweat of his brow was not given as a curse. Through faith and hope, labor was to be a blessing to the descendants of Adam and Eve. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 314. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus the institution has for its originator the creator of the universe. 
Marriage is honorable. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. It was one of the first gifts of God to man, and it is one of the two institutions that, after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. The home of our first parents was to be a pattern for other homes as their children should go forth to occupy the earth. God placed Adam in a garden. This was his dwelling. In the surroundings of the holy pair was a lesson for all time, that true happiness is found not in the indulgence of pride and luxury, but in communion with God through his created works. If men would give less attention to the artificial and would cultivate greater simplicity, they would come far nearer to answering the purpose of God in their creation. Reflecting Christ, page 166. For further reading, The Story of Redemption, The Creation, pages 21 and 22, and Sons and Daughters of God, He is near to all who call upon Him page 19.